everyone, welcome back to the channel. I'm so excited to have with me today Thomas from Tommy's Truth Talk. Some of you I know are familiar with his channel, but for those of you who are not, make sure to go check it out. Thomas is what I would consider an expert on the subject of Christian universalism, um, specifically from a biblical perspective and from a uh, the perspective of the early church fathers and what they believed about it. So I'm very excited to have him on here today to get into some of these topics. Thank you so much for being here, Thomas. And I think that we will just go ahead and get started. And I'll have you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a Christian universalist. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This is a great joy. This is a privilege, really. Uh, and I likewise familiarized, uh, yeah, thank you. Familiarized myself with your channel a little bit, and I can see you have a very successful channel. A lot of people following you, and you do a tremendous job. So, um, well, so do you. I absolutely love your videos and the energy that you bring to them. Yeah, I'm kind of crazy. I'm kind of a passionate guy. Uh, I get a little out of control sometimes, you know? <laughs> but uh, that's just me. And um, yeah, I uh, this is a privilege for me. I, I'm really looking forward to this. So um, I put some things down in note form here. I can shoot from the hip, but I, I just uh, wanted to bring across certain information and I didn't want to just ramble. So uh, to tell you a little bit about myself um, and how I became a believer in ultimate restoration, I grew up in Northern Virginia and uh, I was involved in sports and music. I was a trumpet player. And uh, so I got a scholarship to attend LSU, uh, School of Music as a trumpet performance major in Baton Rouge. And I came to Baton Rouge in 1991. And I attended LSU from 91 to 94. And May 7th, 1994, I had a born again experience on the campus of LSU. And it, it, was, it was radical for me. It was very dramatic. Um, I came from a family really of like agnostics and atheists. And so this was very radical for me. And I ended up leaving LSU shortly after that to pursue the call of God on my life and to just kind of figure life out. And I went in another direction. I did not go into a career in music. Things happened very rapidly for me. In 1995, I got married to Sarah. And in 1996, I took a job in the building industry. So around 2000, I started to question all my beliefs and look deeper into what I actually believed after I met a man named Clark Blanchard. Clark Blanchard was actually a Jehovah Witness, and a, um, he was involved in that uh, heavily, but he began to just, you know, uh, bring things to my attention about hell and so it caused me to look into everything that I believed. In 2001, I had a career change in the building industry, and I met a man named Lewis Thompson. Lewis Thompson was the greatest man of God that I ever met. And I ended up calling him the man with the boots. And that's a story in and of itself. But I also met his son, Billy Thompson. And Lewis Thompson and Billy Thompson were the two that introduced me to the restoration of all things. And I resisted it at first, but then I studied and saw the information was undeniable. And I want to say something here, though, about receiving revelation from God, because this is extremely important. You know, we, we must study to show ourselves approved. But without this key element, it's not only hard to see the ultimate restoration of all things, it is, in my opinion, impossible. And it is this, that we must have revelation from God. So in Ephesians 1, 15 through 22, 
the passage says, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, and here's the key, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So, I mean, I, I just hope that resonates with people about receiving revelation, you know, hmm. and coming to the knowledge of this ultimate restoration of all things. And that's a little bit of, you know, my background and how I got to the place where I believed in an ultimate restoration of all things. That's a beautiful story. So you went from atheist agnostic to born again experience to Christian universalism um, in a, would you say it was a relatively short period of time? Yes, everything that happened with me, once I had the born again experience, it was a lot of stuff happening in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first had the born again experience, it was about seven years later that I began to look into this ultimate restoration. Mm -hmm. So I was... It was about seven years that I was in, as we would call, the eternal hellfire camp mm -hmm. of a way of believing about Jesus and about the Bible. Mm -hmm. Okay. I also yeah. really appreciate your point about the revelation because that is how it happened for me also. And of course, there has to be a balance between, you know, revelation and then studying, as you said, Absolutely. studying to show yourself approved. But um, having either one without the other can lead you wrong. So yeah, I, I definitely appreciate that point you made there. That's a great point, you know, um, that it takes both, you know, for many years I would read the Bible and study and a lot of it, I had absolutely no idea what I was even reading and, and what I yes. was getting into, but you have to put the dead, so to speak, letter of the word in there so that mm -hmm. the spirit of God can breathe on it and give you the revelation. Of mm -hmm. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I sort of had this revelation, like this amazing revelation. And then I went and looked at the Bible and I'm like, everything in the Bible sort of came alive to me in a new way. And I saw everything completely differently. So anyway, yeah, I just, I resonate with what you said there. So for our second question here, I'd like to ask you what some of your favorite Bible passages are about Christ saving all, maybe some passages that most people miss because there's a lot in there. And you have a series on your channel where you go through all the passages in the Bible that deal with this subject. And a lot of them I had never thought of before. Yes, yes. And the important thing that I would always bring across to people is to stay with the scriptures and to stay with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a Jesus man. And I'm a scripture man. And I'm always going to be that. And that was really how that I learned it and how I saw it was through the scriptures. And some people will ask me in the beginning, well, man, I hear you talking about this, but 
gosh, is there anything in the Bible that even talks about this? Mm -hmm. And I'll joke with them in the beginning and they'll ask me for some scriptures that talk about this. And I'll, I'll even tell them, well, you want some scriptures that talk about ultimate restoration of all things? How about Genesis through Revelation? <laughs> you see it. It comes alive in the entire yes. Bible. Yes. So, you know, uh, let, let me take us through this. Got a section here that I want to read about Hannah Whittall Smith. Hannah Whittall Smith was a famous person in history who came to an understanding of the restoration of all things. This is some of her testimony, if, if everyone could just bear with me for a minute as we go through just a little bit of this here about how she came to this revelation. So reading from her testimony, she said that salvation is absolutely equal to the fall. There is to be a final restitution of all things when at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee, every tongue, words could not be more all-embracing. The how and the when I could not see, but the one essential fact was all I needed. Somewhere and somehow God was going to make everything right for all the creatures he had created. My heart was at rest about it forever. I hurried home to get hold of my Bible to see the magnificent fact I had discovered could possibly have been all this time in the Bible, and I had not seen it. And the moment I entered the house, I did not wait to take off my bonnet. Now, that's big in those days. She didn't even, take, didn't even wait to take off her bonnet but rushed at once to the table where I always kept my Bible and concordance ready for use and began my search. And here's what she says here. Immediately, the whole book seemed to be illuminated. There's the revelation, the illumination. On every page, the truth concerning the times of restitution of all things, of which the apostle Peter says, God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, shone forth, and no room was left for questioning. I turned greedily from page to page of my Bible, fairly laughing aloud for joy at the blaze of light that illuminated it all. It became a new book. Another skin seemed to have been peeled off every text, and my Bible fairly shone with new meaning. I do not say with a different meaning, for in no sense did the new meaning contradict the old, but a deeper meaning, the true meaning hidden behind the outward form of words. The words did not need to be changed. They only needed to be understood. Hmm. And now at last, I began to understand them. And that's one of the things Melissa, is that so many Christians, they've read the Bible for their whole life, but a lot of it, they just don't understand what it's actually talking about. Yes. They don't understand that this message is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And so I'll just go over some scriptures here and, um, you know, if it gets too long, I don't have to do every one, but they're all good. I can't help myself. They're a <laughs> bunch of Go for it. So as we start off in Genesis 18, 18, and you know, as we go through some of these scriptures, some of them speak of the ultimate restoration in more of a general sense. And some of them speak of it very specifically, almost like knocking us down or knocking us over with it. Genesis 18, 18. Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So people read that. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him and don't even realize 
This is actually going to happen and affect all the nations of the earth. They will ultimately be blessed in him. Psalm twenty two twenty seven. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. What? I mean, that's like incredible. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. Not only are they turning to the Lord, but they're remembering. That means we all came from God and we will all eventually return back to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 26, 9. With my soul, I have desired you in the night. Yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So, very important that we understand this. God's judgments teach people righteousness. Right, Melissa? I mean, God's judgments do not torture people forever, but they are for the purpose of correction. Don't you yes. find that in your studies? Oh, yes. That's one of those things that you would think would be common knowledge to us. I mean... We just know that. Absolutely. Isaiah 45, 22 through 23. I have sworn by myself. This is God swearing here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> nothing's going to stop this from happening. God is swearing and swearing by himself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath or swear. Luke 2.10, then the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good tidings of great, great joy, which will be to all people. The joy is eventually going to be to all people. All people. See, there's one I had never noticed. <laughs> yes. John 4.42. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. I love that, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. And see, when many people hear that or say that or talk about that, they say, oh, well, I believe Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. But what they're saying is they believe that he is potentially the Savior of the world. Yep. If people muster up enough free moral agency to get on board with it. Mm -hmm. But it's not saying that. It is actually declaring that he is not the potential Savior of the world, but the actual Savior of the world. Yes. And then ultimately, everyone will be saved through him. So John 12, 32. This one here is magnificent. It's probably one of the most powerful ones among others. John 12, 32. Jesus speaking here said, And I, if I am lift, lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And the English word draw comes from the Greek word helkuo, and it means to drag. Jesus is making a sovereign declaration here that he is going to drag all people to himself. It's, it's amazing. Acts 3.21, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Mm. The word restoration there, that English word, comes from a Greek word, apokatastasis, and it means restoration or restitution. It's actually saying there's going to be a restoration of all things. Got a few more here. Hang on. Romans eleven thirty six. For of God and through him and to him are all things. So that is actually what is referred to as the law of circularity. It means mm -hmm. it's a big circle. 
Everything came from God. Everything exists or is sustained through God, and everything's going back to God. The law of circularity. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28. In Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. These are passages that people have read over for their entire life. Mm -hmm. They don't see what these passages mean because they are reading the scriptures with their minds already made up that most of humanity is going to burn in hell forever. Mm -hmm. Most of humanity is going to be annihilated. So when they get to scriptures like these that absolutely just declare it, they explain it away in their mind or they put on their dancing shoes so they can dance all around it and make it mean something that it doesn't mean. But yeah, just, right. That particular passage I was taught, it meant that um, only some, even though it says all, it, it doesn't mean all, it just meant some. Exactly. But to limit the second part of the phrase, you got to limit the first part. Right. Everybody yeah. wants to say all die in Adam, but they don't want to say all are going to be made alive in Christ. But that's what the passage is actually talking about. That whole passage, 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 28, is one of the most powerful passages mm -hmm. in the whole Bible about this in six verses. It goes from talking about Adam to then at the end of the six verses, it talks about God shall be all in all. Everything, everyone. Yep. It is beautiful. One of my favorites. Yes. And then we have the Philippians 2, 10 through 11. The famous passage, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get any stronger than that. But most people, once again, are programmed to believe that that means, well, God's going to take these people who were already burning in hell and then resurrect them to stand before him to just make them confess his name, and then he's going to send them back to hell and torment them forever. No, that's not what that passage is talking about. That passage is referring to something that's going to happen at the great white throne judgment, that there are going to be many, many people who are coming before Jesus at that time, and they will have the revelation that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and they will joyfully and of their own accord confess his name, and bow their knee to him. Colossians 1, 16 through 20 is an amazing passage. It basically says all things were created by Jesus Christ, and then the same all things are going to be reconciled back to him through the blood of his cross. 1 John 2, 2, we just got a couple more here. Jesus is the atonement for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. And 1 John 4.14, 4, we have seen and testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's one of my favorites. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I mean, is he going to succeed or did he succeed or did he fail? He came to be the Savior. And what's the outcome? One more, Revelation 5.13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne. Every creature, Melissa, right? Yeah. Every creature is seen praising God in that scripture. So those are just some of many scriptures that are in the Bible that, that speak to it. Yeah, that, that was magnificent, Thomas. And for our listeners, go check his channel because he goes through the, the entire Bible in his uh, Christian Universalism series that he has. So 
Yeah, we, I mean, we could just talk about those for hours, honestly. Yes, so many, so many. And when God opens your eyes to it, you see it. It's it's all through the scriptures. It's always yeah. in there, like Hannah Whitall Smith said. She didn't have to go back and change the Bible or go look for something outside of the Bible or outside of Jesus Christ. That's how she learned it was through the Bible and through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was there all along. Yeah. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Yes. Absolutely. Would you like to talk for a little bit here about the beliefs of the early church fathers? That's another topic that I just feel like you you have so much knowledge on. And also you've, you've shared about that recently on your channel as well, which I found very interesting. This topic, the early church fathers, when I began years ago to look into this ultimate restoration of all things. I was so shocked and so surprised and so excited to find this information. Most people are not aware of this information, um, but it's becoming more and more uh, put out there and, and, and known. And so uh, the amazing thing concerning the early church fathers is that the majority of them believed and taught a final restoration of all things through Jesus Christ for almost the first 500 years of church history. This is little known and understood. They understood the Greek language and that the dealings of God with man were to be for a period of time and for the purpose of correction. They understood the fire spoken of in the New Testament, including the lake of fire and brimstone, which means divine purification to be a metaphor for the judgment of the divine law. So fire in the scriptures equals purification. It doesn't mean that God's going to burn people in literal fire and torture them or that God's going to extinguish them literally and annihilate them. It is a metaphor for divine purification. Mm -hmm. So getting into some of this, we are indebted to scholars such as Ilaria Romelli and David Bentley Hart. And I know you know these Oh, people. yes. And you have uh, featured uh, their writings and their sayings. And... So Ilaria Romelli and David Bentley Hart, just to name a few, who have done extensive research and produced written works on the early church fathers and their beliefs in ultimate restoration through Jesus Christ. Also, George Saris has produced a concise book on the topic entitled Heaven's Doors and features the beliefs of the early church fathers. So he's another one. And uh, he's become a friend of mine. I've talked to him by phone and we invited him into Baton Rouge a couple years ago and um, just a great man. And so his work, Heaven's Doors, also talks about the early church fathers. So endless punishment was not the prevailing teaching during the first five centuries after Christ. Of the six major centers of Christianity in the ancient church, two of them, Alexandria and Caesarea, favored the doctrine of ultimate restoration on the principles of origin. Mm -hmm. And then two, Antioch and Eastern Syria, favored ultimate restoration on the principles of Theodore of Mopsuestia. One, Asia Minor, following Irenaeus held to the annihilation of the wicked mm -hmm. and only one Northern Africa followed um, Augustine strongly mm -hmm. favored the doctrine of future endless punishment. So just to name a few, well, let me say this before we go on. So that's another thing that most people don't realize within these initial centuries following Jesus Christ, there were six centers of learning, and four out of the six taught this ultimate restoration of all things. Right. 
It was the predominant view of the day. So just to name a few of the early church fathers who taught an ultimate restoration of all things through Jesus Christ. Now, Irenaeus, uh, I consulted with Robin Perry on this one. I just wanted to hear what he had to say about Irenaeus because mm -hmm. he's, there's, there's not a whole lot of specific information about if he leaned that way. But basically, Robin Perry said concerning Irenaeus, it is safe to say that important seeds of later universalism are found in his work. Mm -hmm. And then um, others who explicitly affirmed universal salvation are Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Diodorus of Tarsus, and Theodore of Mopsuestia. Mm -hmm. Origen is probably the most famous one associated with this when the topic comes up. Gregory is the most respected of the early mm -hmm. church fathers. In AD 787, the seventh general council of the church honored Gregory by naming him father of the fathers. So his credentials as an influential leader in the early Christian church have never been questioned, and his position on restoration has never been condemned. And didn't he oversee the writing of the Nicene Creed? Yes, and, okay. and I believe he did add something to the end of it, if, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Yes, so reading his comments alone would dispel the notion that the church is always held to a belief in endless punishment. Right. And Gregory based his belief in the ultimate restoration of all on what he saw as the purpose of punishment, the nature of evil, and the character of God. So, I mean, you know, he would ask the question, and we ask it today, does God punish forever? You know, Gregory explained that those who are immature, they think this and fear it. But they, those that are... Uh, I'm sorry. So they are thus motivated to flee from wickedness. However, those with more maturity understand that the true purpose of after death, after death punishment would be for the purpose of correction. Mm -hmm. So it's a remedial process instituted by God to ultimately restore to health those who are sick. Like a skilled physician who doesn't stop until his work is finished, God does not give up on those he created. And that's just a point that many people just don't realize about God. I mean, physical death does not hinder God. God's not going to give up. And he continues to work beyond this life. So, for Gregory, evil in its very nature is self-destructive. It will eventually disappear because God is good. His ultimate goal is the final accord of the whole universe with himself. According to Gregory, in due course, evil will pass over into non-existence. It will disappear utterly from the realm of existence. Divine and uncompounded goodness will encompass within itself every rational nature. No single being created by God will fail to achieve the kingdom of God. Mm. What a powerful statement. And so now we got to say a little bit here about Augustine. Because we mentioned all these names of these early church fathers who carried this predominant view of the ultimate restoration of all things. But then comes Augustine coming into about the, you know, early to mid 400s. And he's very important character. So Augustine was born in what is now Algeria in AD 354 and died in 430. The classical schooling he received in colonial North Africa was conducted principally in Latin. 
As a boy, he rebelled against learning Greek because he did not like Greek literature and he was, that he was forced to study and his teachers beat their students. He commented in his confessions, here's him speaking, but why did I so much hate the Greek, which I studied as a boy? I do not yet fully know, for not one word of it did I understand. And to make me understand, I was urged vehemently with cruel threats and punishments. Mm. So as a result of this, the result was that Augustine could not read the New Testament in its original language. And that put him at a clear disadvantage in understanding some of the finer points of the Greek text, as compared with the earlier Greek fathers who read New Testament in their native tongue. So... Mm -hmm. Unlike Clement, Origen, Gregory of Nyssa, Diodorus, and Theodore of Mopsuestia, and others who understood the Greek term defining the duration of punishment as meaning an in indeterminate period of time, Augustine assumed and insisted that it meant never ending. Okay, so mm -hmm. he believed most would never be saved. And Augustine was a powerful person in church yes. history. Mm -hmm. And he ended up swinging the pendulum over to this from the idea of the ultimate restoration of all things, which was the predominant view in the day, mm -hmm. to now this idea of eternal torture or never-ending punishment. So Augustine was convinced that God is sovereign and could save all. But in fact, he will only save some. In Augustine's view, God does not have a kind purpose in punishing because God has so structured the next world that death will never be abolished. Hmm. And, you know, from that time forward, as you get into the mid 400s, going into the 500s, then this idea, because of Augustine, and others, this idea of eternal torture began to become the popular view. And then if you just, you know, take, for example, the world going into the dark ages mm -hmm. and then people having this dark outlook on God that most of humanity will go to hell and burn in hell forever and ever. And then let's say, if the dark ages lasted approximately a thousand years, this truth of the ultimate restoration of all things began to slip away. It began mm -hmm. to become buried. It began to become little known. And that's what happened in a nutshell, basically. You know? Yeah. Do you think there's an element of maybe the, the church at the time using that teaching to for power to keep people under their control absolutely because fear is a good way to control people yeah and fear manipulation politics power position all of that you know also entered into it and it just caused that bad, false message of eternal torture to flourish, so to speak. And now people are having to go back in history and mm -hmm. uncover that these early church fathers actually did believe that Jesus Christ was going to save everybody. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it, it was one of the one of the most uh, beautiful discoveries that I came across and someone can avail themselves to these scholars, Laria Ramelli, David Bentley Hart, mm -hmm. and, and just Google search these things and look up the names that we mentioned and there's quote after quote of what they actually said about it, that they, they believed, you know, that um, fire was for purification Punishment was for the purpose of correction, and they understood certain key Greek words uh, that we'll get into, you know, in some of the other 
questions that you have for me. And these um, Hebrew and Greek words lended themselves to the idea that punishment was for a period of time and for the purpose of correction, not mm -hmm. like we see in the leading selling modern English translations, like forever and eternal and forever and ever. Right. And it's associated with punishment. And it, it gives people the wrong ideas that um, God's going to just punish people forever and ever and ever and ever. It, it's, yeah. just, it's, ridiculous. it's ridiculous. Yeah. And this is sort of getting into a little bit of a different topic, but it, it really comes down to um, what is the character of God and how do we view God um, and how has God revealed himself to us? Because to think that God would just punish people for the sake of punishment. Well, that's a God of, of revenge and anger. And is that who God is? That's not how he's revealed himself at all. Great point. Great point. And it, it comes down to when God gives a person revelation about this, that you see a simple point that mm -hmm. God is corrective, not vindictive. Absolutely. He's corrective. And, and people, you know, they, you know, that have children. I mean, why would you punish your child? Or mm -hmm. Why would you put your child through something? Not to, not to just hurt them or be vindictive or to torment them or to, my God, torment them forever. I mean, right. you know, you to correct, to correct the child and to teach them and to restore them. Yes, and it's always for a higher purpose. Yeah. That's God's character.